family is a really diverse family of plants. Anyone want to guess what number one is? Legumes. No, yeah. they're third. Okay. <laughs> Grasses. <laughs> Grasses are the most abundant, like species-wise, the most diverse family of plants here in the Rio Grande Valley. There's a lot of different asters and sunflowers to look at. Um, and they do have some different flower types sometimes, but one of the key ones, and is it okay if I sacrifice a, a flower here? <laughs> One of the key things is that they have what are these compound flower heads. So this is not one flower. This is many, many flowers all together on one head here. And different types of, of sunflowers will either have disc flowers, which are the central. We'll look at an actual calpin daisy, I think, in a little bit. That would be a better, clear example of that. But there are disc flowers, which are that center kind of part. And then there's ray flowers, right, that come out. Um, but each individual one of these little, these little tubes coming out of that flower there are an individual flower. So when this plant gets visited by a bee or another pollinator and it's just rummaging around in there, it's pollinating a whole bunch of flowers all at once. And then you end up with a seed head that has a whole bunch of seeds on it. Another feature of a lot of sunflower family plants is that their, their seeds, called akines often, or um, cypsella is another word for them, but a lot of times they have this little hair-like structure that's on them so that they blow in the wind, right? Think of dandelions. Not as pretty of a scent, but grab a leaf from this little plant right here. This is uh, called a goose foot. This is Phenopodium phalangieri, and it has kind of a, a funky smell to it. Uh, my, I would compare it to like let the air out of like an inner tube of a tire. Kind of a, kind of a nasty smell there. Oddly enough, this is an edible plant. I thought am I getting Um You can eat the greens of this plant. Um, it is and fortunately, the smell does not translate to taste, so <laughs> but that's a Kinopodium berlangieri. This is kind of a very common cool season, spring um, herbaceous plant that will pop up. These flowers are not viable. They can't be pollinated. The ones that are viable are those five little outward star petals there. So this is Parthenium hysteriforus. This is a very common um, weedy plant in an area. It can kind of take over a zone. I think there's some thought that it might be what's called a level pathic. So what happens is sometimes plants will release chemicals kind of out into the soil and it can inhibit the growth of other plants around. So there's some thought that this might be slightly allelopathic. Um, probably don't want to have like huge densities in an area because again it can kind of just knock down that diversity. But I do see local wildlife using it. Pollinators will go to it, and uh, birds like lesser goldfinch and housefinch will come down the buds and the seeds of this plant. Zone, and this uh, nice orangey red and yellow is called firewheel. This is another sunflower type family, um, Gagardia. And uh, you can see it kind of has some different flower colors going on there. I'm not sure, not sure what's going on there. But this is a really pretty annual plant that will can bloom a lot of the year in the, in the valley. Once you get a few going, they get out these little kind of spiky seed heads and you'll just have them keep coming back time after time. This is one that's really readily available in seed mixes. So if you want to order it, order some seeds online, you can absolutely find that. It's a really nice, pretty plant. And you'll see lots of bees going to it. Uh, so P-type legume flowers are bilaterally symmetrical. So this is um, a lupinus, lupinus texensis, Texas blue bonnet, beautiful little plant. Um, bees like to go to it. Uh, it's got what we would call palmate leaves, right? So palmate, think of your palm, right? So this is like five fingers coming out in a palm pattern here. And a lot of beans either have palmate leaves, or like the mesquite and the, and the misace have pinnate leaves, which are these like feathery like leaves. Uh, but yeah, really pretty blue bonnets right there. I think, 
I'm not sure it's I'm not sure on this. You might want to confirm, look it up. But do you think the older flowers that have been pollinated get a color change to that center part there? So you'll notice the bottom one here is kind of purplish. And these top ones are yellow or white. Um, and I think, if I remember it correctly, that the bees will recognize that that plant is already, that flower has already been like attended to, and they'll focus on the ones that have not been attended. But I would look that up, all right? This is one of the milkweed vines right here. Here's two very common vines that you'll see. This is climbing milkweed. This is what we have, this is what we'd say it has a chordate leaf or a heart-shaped leaf. We've got a nice little heart shape there. Um, and it's a milkweed. When you break a leaf or a stem, it's gonna have this white latexy sap. Pretty stinky, pretty stinky plant. Um, I've read different things about whether it's actually a host plant for monarchs or not. Most of the time, monarchs host on milkweeds in the genus Sclepius. Um, but some people will say they'll also use plants like this, which is Unastrum. But this is climbing milkweed. This is a very common plant that'll cover cover a, a trellis, cover a fence, or just grow vining on the ground like this. I've seen it a fair amount out in the shallow caliche soils of Star County. So you'll see it at places like Aturia Brush, you'll see it at places like La Puerta. Um, really drought uh, tolerant plant, and it's the host plant for some of these white butterflies. Um, and yes, that's actually what they're called. There's this family of called whites, the sulfur, the sulfur family. Whites and yellow, whites and sulfurs. Uh, but yeah, this is red whisker clammy weed, and it's starting to get these little capsules. And the capsules will have tons of these little uh, round seeds in there. And then this little plant, I didn't point it out earlier. This is one of these ones that I think it kind of depends on who you talk to. Some people say it's native, some people say it's not native. Um, I will say, regardless of what its status is considered, I really like this little plant. Um, it's not gonna be super aggressive that it'll like take over an area because it's a pretty low growing thing. And bees and butterflies just go nuts for it. It's a great one. It's really drought tolerant. This is Tridax daisy. Um, and this is a really easy one to collect seed from. If you're just walking along a canal or like a railroad track or something, you'll often sometimes see this little tridax daisy. So when I dug up uh, part of my, my lawn and I wanted it to be a little wildflower area, I actually grabbed just some tridax daisy seeds from the hub here, scattered them out there. This is another bean tree. This is a very pettable tree as well. This is called tepawahe. And um, I'm gonna save a leaf so I can show you this versus the popinat, which is another bean tree that grows on the hub. Um, this one has very, very small feathery leaflets. This, if I'm not mistaken, this is the equivalent of, let me, do we have a sunflower around here? It's oh, one leaf. Bee. This is one leaf right here, right? This is not many, many leaves. This is one leaf. So what happens biologically, Thank you, Stephanie. So this is the biological equivalent of this. And what's happened for a lot of our legumes and things like that, they don't have to worry about getting enough sun, right? We get plenty of sun here in the summer. But what they do have to worry about is losing water. And so when you limit the surface area of your leaf, you're limiting how much water is escaping from those stomata, those pores on the underside of the leaves. So you're, it's a water conservation method. You reduce your leaf area, you're still getting more than enough sun, but you're limiting how much water is lost. Another feature of plants that they have, like obviously sunflowers are also very drought tolerant plants. There are other things that go on, but sometimes le uh, leaves will be very hairy. That's another um, method of kind of creating an insulating like little layer there. Or sometimes they'll just have a really thick waxy surface on it. But those are kind of some traits there. But yeah, one leaf, one leaf. Let's talk about cowpen daisy. This is one of my favorite annual wildflowers. Um, another really drought tolerant, very hardy wildflower. Um, presumably called cowpen daisy because it likes to grow in that sort of disturbed area around a cowpen. Um, it's an annual, so it'll live its entire life in the span of a year or so. It'll grow. 
flower like crazy, produce tons and tons of seeds. So if you just get one or two of these plants and you have space around it, it'll fill that space. Um, but Calpin Daisy is absolutely fantastic. This is another sunflower with disc flowers and ray flowers there. These are in the same family. So these are both in the Boraginaceae family. So the wild olive or the Anakawisa, one of a very commonly used native tree in ornament as an ornamental landscaping tree um, because it flowers all the time. So it's always pretty. Um, and it also is extremely drought tolerant. Like it sends down a deep tap root um, and just doesn't need any extra watering basically. And then this is Anakwa, and this is the same family as this plant. So when you look at these flowers there, they both have these kind of five petals that are a little fused there. Wow. They're in the same family. And I just saw it, I don't know if it's still there. A lot of insects specialize on certain types of plants, right? So you've got some things that are very tightly, so like one type of plant, one species, one genus, Monarchs and milkweeds, for example. Monarch butterfly is for the Asclepius milkweeds. The border patch is a little bit more generalist, where it can be on different kinds of sunflowers and different genera. Um, but for the most part, they tend to go for a certain kind of plant. So John did a great job about talking about our smaller native plants, and I actually learned a lot about, you know, the smaller invasive plants. I specialize more on the seeds uh, since I do restoration work. So what I do is I collect seeds from all over the Rivina Valley, and those seeds are used for restoration purposes. So for me, when I t think of edible plants, I think of food. Um, so uh, it was super cool learning about all the edible other parts of plants. But so I'm gonna go over some of the plants that are actually more like fruits. But you know, over time, the people that have lived here in this area, both in uh, South Texas and into Northeastern Mexico, have found a lot of uses to these edible plants. You know, uh, you know, you've probably grown up, uh, if not eating, or you've been around people that have eaten nopal, chile piquín. Uh, plants like that. So today we're going to go over some other plants that, you know, are edible and we might not know. So here on the first page, the first one is Texas persimmon. And Texas persimmon is a plant that's distributed here in South Texas and it actually goes up into like San Antonio. Uh, but it's a plant that has purple fruits. They turn from green to purple when mature and they're very sweet. Um, it's kind of hard pinpointing when to go and collect them because uh, wildlife love to eat them as well. So it'll often be like a competition of who can I go and get them before the wildlife get to them. But they taste really sweet. Um, and also you can typically find them in the summer. So usually in the late spring, early summer. Uh, and it's a species without thorns. So that's a, a pretty good giveaway of what plant it is. It's also kind of like a tree, it's a taller shrub. Um, so. Sanita or Barbados cherry. It's called that because the little orange, or not, the little red uh, fruits look like little apples. Um, but that one is also, also used as an ornamental plant. So you can find it naturally in the thorn forest or the thorn scrub ecosystem. But a lot of people actually use it. Like it, I remember seeing it at ETRGV in several areas. Like people use it as, ornam as an ornamental plant. It has beautiful pink flowers. Um, and the fruits, um, they are edible and they actually have a super high vitamin C content. Um, the genus itself, Melphigia, uh, it's been used to make like vitamin C supplements. It's a lot higher than like, you know, citrus fruit. Um, so that's cool to know. One of our tr edible trees, Texas Ebony. Um, it's a super common tree. It's one of our keystone species. You can find it in most thorn forest fragments. Uh, a lot of a lot of our wildlife depend on making home for this tree, and uh, the pods are these tamarindo looking things. You've probably seen them before. Uh, you can eat them when they're green, and you can eat them when they're mature and brown. So when they're green, um, I've heard that you can just like boil the green pods, and then you can eat the seed. So you can't eat the pods, you eat the seed, and then when they're mature. 
So when they look like this, this brown uh, like case, and it rattles, so that's when you know it's mature. Um, you can roast the seeds, so you can open, it's very hard to open these pods. Uh, if they're not like already naturally open, you can open it with a hammer or something like you know, some type of blunt force. Um, and then you can roast the, the beans. Um, and I've actually talked to a lot of members of the community that give me their recipe, like, oh, my abuelo cook it this way and things like that. Um, so I love that connection with, uh, you know, people talking about their recipes. Um, and you can make coffee out of it. So not, it doesn't have caffeine in it, but it's, it tastes a lot like coffee. So it's a coffee substitute. And then right next to it is the buds for prickly pear cactus. And uh, it's one of those, you know, uh, cultural, very important species. You've probably seen it everywhere. The very widely distributed species. And uh, you can eat both the pads, so that lobe looking thing, and you can eat the seed. So the fruits are called tunas, and those are typically on the, or they develop after the flowers. Um, and the pads you can eat them by removing the you know the blockheads and then you can i've heard people eating them raw you can make like salads from the nopales or you can cook them and you know uh, a lot of people like to grill them they're very good for your health um i've heard a lot of people that have diabetes and nopal eating eating it it helps you lower your a1c levels and everything so it's, it's, it's a very good uh, staple food um, to include and it's very uh, easy to grow like if you want to have it in your backyard you know I highly encourage you to have some nopal available and in this other page we have chile piquin so chile piquin is one of those iconic species uh, I think we're lucky in that uh, it's native to our ecosystem it is the mother chile so all other chiles uh, have come from chile piquin so that's actually really cool uh, in my opinion but you can eat it both when it's like green and red um, but i mean it's really spicy if you're into making salsas and things like that i highly encourage you to go out and get yourself a chile piquin right next to it is a species that uh, john went over which is the henno or spiny hackberry and uh, it is a thorny plant um, but uh, so in counterpart with uh, what is it sugar hackberry spiny hackberry is very thorny and it has very delicious, in my opinion, uh, fruits. They're orange when they're ready, so they turn from green to orange, and they kind of taste like melon. Um, Brazil. So Brazil is, uh, I find it very similar to Granjeno in its growth type, so it's kind of like this shrubby, uh, almost tree-like plant, um, and it's very thorny as well, but the fruits of it are purple. So it actually also uh, has fruits available around the time that Vangeno does, which is in the spring, early summer. So I didn't mention that about Vangeno, but it's around this time um, that it starts producing the flowers, which we saw some today, the flower buds. Uh, and Brazil is also very delicious in my opinion. Uh, the berries can be used to make jelly. So I've had Brazil jelly and it's delicious. Um, and it's also like a really good introductory species if you want to go out and try Brazil, you know, if you'll probably like it. It's not something that, you know, is potentially dangerous to you. Just always make sure that you for sure know that this is Brazil. You know, don't try to eat something else. And in this next page, we have yuca. And yuca is one of those super characteristic thorn forest species. It's beautiful. Um, if you've been out right now to any of our national wildlife refuges from Laguna Tascosa to Estudio Brush, um, you've seen that there is probably yucca flowering. So right now is uh, a really good time to see yucca flower. And uh, the flowers themselves are edible. They're called cholas. Um, so I've heard a lot of people that eat them in like traditional recipes. Um, I think you can cook them like basically you just grab the flowers and you cook them with like onion and you grill them. Um, and the fruits are also edible to humans. Um, and you just need to wait for them to turn like a, a yellow color. So you don't want to eat them when they're green, but it gives off a really good scent. And uh, the birds themselves love them as well. It's a bird dispersed species. Uh, really important to have uh, in your ecosystem if you want to have like specific uh, moss like the yucca moth is 
you know, very species specific with the species. So if you want to have that on your property, or if you want to have that very characteristic species on there, and potentially have some flowers and some fruits to eat later in the season. Right next to it is elbow bush, and elbow bush isn't a thorny species. Uh, it's a very, I call it a friendly species because it won't do anything to you. It's more of a shrub rather than a tree. Uh, and right now is actually a really good time to go out and find some elbow bush, at least on the west side of the valley. Uh, I collected some earlier this week and I snacked on it while collecting, yeah. so that was fun. Uh, but the fruits turn from green to purple and they have a slight bitter taste, but they it's mostly like a sweet little taste that they have. Uh, the birds, it's again bird dispersed and a uh, very cool species that's very commonly included in restoration because it's one of those uh, keystone species like if you want to have uh, a lot of birds on your restoration site if you have elbow bush that basically ensures that you'll have birds coming through and then they'll come and disperse more seeds in your site and eventually you'll have you know succession Right next to it is Tazajillo, and Tazajillo is a cacti, so it, it's a very unique look, looking cacti, it kind of looks like a plant itself, but it's all, you know, succulent. And the fruits are red when they're mature, and those are actual medicinal, so they're, they've been used medicinally by the people of this area to treat like colds and sore throats and things like that. Um, I've also, well the jelly itself is just really good, so if you're into trying different things. Here on the last page we have honey mesquite, which is a species that John went over and you know it's very common, it's probably next to uh, Nopales, it's probably the most common species you can see in the valley. Uh, it's actually uh, edible, so the pods themselves can be eaten like straight off from the pods once they turn. Like, uh, like a yellow or like red splotchy color and they're actually really sweet but you can also make this sweet flower and then right next to that we have a nagua or the sandpaper tree which we you know we're exposed to today and it has uh, fruits when they're mature they're like orange to red and they're very sweet so I missed out this is the first native plant that I ever ate an aqua and it was uh it's really good it makes so i encourage you to have it on your property uh probably not next to like a cement thing because it does drop a lot of fruits and it can get quite messy but uh it's very good for wildlife you know wildlife love it the birds love it you could probably make jelly from it uh it's one of those berry like species